Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for showing up in, you know, with so many of you. Um, this is a core conversation. Um, we started those um, you know, many years ago now, but uh, the goal is for it to be a conversation. So only in five slides. And um, after those five slides are presented, I would love to, you know, to, for all of us to discuss uh, some, of the, some of the things presented um, in, in those five slides. Um, the retrospective um, is something that we try to do after or around the end of every major release cycle. And the goal is really to learn you know, what worked and what should we do more of or continue to do, but also what didn't quite work and how can we improve what we do. And uh, I think in Drupal we have a, a culture of, of, you know, we set a very high bar, I think, we're never quite happy. Like I remember after the Drupal 7 release, like we had these huge release parties all around the world, I think in over 100 countries. And literally at the release party, people were whining about all the things we didn't do in 7 and all the things we should do. And so I think it just speaks to our culture of um, you know, not, not actually always being able to celebrate our successes and all the great things uh, that we did and always trying to push ourselves uh, to do better. And, um, I think we have to do the same with the way we develop Drupal, not just the quality of the software itself, but you know, how we organize ourselves as a community. And just to go back way in time, you know, many of you may not notice, but um, you know, you know, when I started Drupal, it was just a project, you know, for me. It was me building Drupal for my own website. And at some point, I decided to make it available as open source. And I literally just created a tarball, uploaded it to my site, I expected maybe 10 people to download it and install it. Um, and so the way we then collaborated is people would email me patches. And so for the longest time, we had a, a mailing list, Drupal Devil, um, you know, I think we still have it. I don't think anyone uses it anymore. But and the the way we worked was essentially, yeah, sure, email me a patch on the mailing list, and then other people on the mailing list would look at the patch, critique it on the mailing list, and then you know, like sort of play ping pong and email the patches. And then at some point we said, you know what, we should really use an issue tracker for this. Um, and so that's when we ended up building project module, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but it is an example of how we evolved our process, right, and how we made it more scalable and scalable over time. Another thing that I used to do is like whenever I would make, well, first of all, we developed Drupal pretty much on Drupal.org. So Drupal.org was running ahead. And so when I would make an API change to Drupal, um, I would then basically go into the contributed module repository and fix all the modules. <laughs> so you could literally like, open every single module, quickly make the API change, commit all the changes. And so if you go to my D2O profile, it these random commits in like a whole bunch of modules. <laughs> and the only thing I really did was like, make a small API change. Uh, anyway, so that's also something that we've uh, evolved uh, and that we do much better today. And so, um, you know, today we're gonna, we're gonna start the conversation. I don't think we'll get to, um, you know, all, all solutions here today, but we're gonna start the conversation for a retrospective, and we're going to start brainstorming some ideas of what we can do differently, uh, so that we can, uh, you know, evolve our project. Um, so one of the things we did is um, we did a survey, and I'll come to the, the survey results in a second. Um, but before I wanted to talk about the survey results, I wanted to show you uh, this slide, which shows some of the things that we have done, things that we have changed during the Drupal 8 release cycle, just to show that um, we always try to make changes. You know, we never stop making these changes. And so things like we moved to Git, you know, people um, may not remember, but we used to um, use CVS. And uh, then we, we moved to Git, which was a huge, um, you know, a huge amount of work. Um, we also introduced this idea of initiatives, with initiatives having a goal and a purpose. And there being initiative leads as a way to scale the development of Drupal core. Uh, we really truly embraced this idea of getting off the island. Um, so instead of implementing everything ourselves, we started to leverage things like Symfony or you know, libraries like Guzzle and, and stuff like that. Um, 
that was a, that was more of a cultural change, I would say. Uh, we introduced things like core con contribution mentoring, um, you know, where people have mentors where issues are tagged specifically, so you know, novice people can pick them up more easily. We've already announced semantic versioning, you know, for Drupal 8. Once Drupal 8 is released, we're gonna you know, have minor feature versions and patch versions, and so that will allow continuous integration. Um, we have a dedicated D.O. team. The Drupal Association is now helping us with um, you know, all of Drupal.org, which back in the day was pretty much the core developers that would also build Drupal.org, which um, is kind of a, a, an artifact of the fact that Drupal.org was always running ahead. Um, we did Drupal 8 Accelerate. We raised uh, $250,000 that we used to unblock critical bugs in Drupal 8. Uh, we announced some changes to our governance structure as well. Uh, and in the process, we added additional core committers and we um, formalized some of the roles and the responsibilities of each of the core committers. There's people that have an, an uh, you know, that, that spend more time on release management. There's people that spend more time on sort of product management and things like that. So we always try to make things better. And so at any given time, you can get feedback or, you know, start the process of trying to make a change. Okay. Um, having said that, we did this survey. We had about 48 people respond to the survey, which I thought was pretty good. And a lot of the responses were very thoughtful. Some people really submitted, like, I don't know, like multi page answers. Uh, so it shows that people really care. Um, I'm not going to show these answers, um, but we did summarize them a little bit. And so we asked people these three, que these three questions basically, what worked well, what didn't work well. And what are some suggestions for improvements that we can make in the future? Um, one second. All right. And so and the next slide is the, the, the summary of the, of the answer to the first question. So the highlights, and they're, they're ranked by the um, number of people that basically said this. So the, the most important uh, highlight is at the top. So, most people love that we got off the island. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, embracing libraries, removing Drupalisms from our code, people loved. Um, but also the fact that we uh, are not contributing to third-party projects as well. That was also mentioned as, as one of these highlights. Um, code base overhaul, adopting PHP best practices, opting, you know, adopting the uh, you know, object-oriented PHP, people people love all of these things. The community, it's kind of a vague answer, but um, people absolutely love the way we work and how collaborative we are, that we get together at events, and just kind of, you know, the way we do what we do. Uh, initiatives are interesting because they're both a highlight and a low light. You'll see initiatives also on the low light slide, but um, people specifically called out you know, multilingual Twitch configuration management and views as successful initiatives. Um, and, you know, across these answers, what, what, what is clear is what the reason these initiatives are successful, according to um, the, the, the survey results, is because they had a plan, people called out the fact that they had regular meetings, that people could uh, join. Um, they also mentioned focus boards and like ways of organizing these initiatives and you know getting people to, you know providing insight to others and ways for others to get involved. They all have teams behind these initiatives as well and strong leaders too. So there's all these ingredients I think that we can find across these initiatives and that people called out. Um, the mentoring that we do was a highlight. Uh, people called out. Um, the, the, you know, leadership in general, both, you know, from initiative leadership to um, some of the leadership and, and changes that we've seen with, with the core committers as well. Like we do, you know, um, issue triage calls. Um, I think there's almost a call. Well, there's multiple calls usually every week where all sorts of things get discussed. And like we kind of just kind of adopted a more mature way of working. Um, and I think that was, that was working very well. Um, uh, you know, people, different ways of expressing um, 
the fact that core developers had financial support, you know, from Drupal 8 Accelerate to the fact that um, some organizations employ full-time developers. Um, you know, people people thought it was very healthy, uh, and you know, generally wondering how do we do more of that. So I think that's a bit of an open question in our community. And then what was nice is that you know, also several people really liked sort of the end result. Um, you know, that we, we managed to build, you know, sort of the feeling that Drupal 8 will be, you know, a, a great release at the right time uh, with the right set of features. You know, people called out things like, you know, WYSIWYG or mobile first or, you know, all sorts of features were being called out. So generally, I think people feel like Drupal 8 will be a solid release. Um, yes, there's probably lots of things you can do better, but I think Overall, people feel pretty good about what's in the room. So, I guess from a product management point of view, um, things work that well. Are you ready for the lowlights? Yeah. By far, most people dislike the long release cycle, um, which you know I think we all agree with. <laughs> um, people said we did too much. We tried to do too much. Um, could be a cost, or could be the cost, it could result in this long release cycle. Um, people felt we could do more around oversight, planning, and project management. Um, you know, people expressed it in many different ways, like, you know, lack of clear goals. Um, some people said we needed to do more require requirement gathering up front, and have more design discussions up front, visual design, but also architecturally. Um, and sort of front-loading a lot of these things. Um, you know, that was there. And then, you know, schedule and arrangement of release uh, cycle milestones was also a very common uh, complaint. People felt like, you know, we started the Drupal 8 branch too early. Um, you know, we, we announced the feature freeze too early. Maybe we should have announced the API freeze before feature freeze. Like, various kinds of uh, feedback around uh, the schedule and the release management process. Um, other people said, you know, the way we work is pretty waterfall. Uh, another comment was that the beta to beta updates took too long. Uh, others suggested that maybe the release shouldn't be blocked on criticals. I'm not expressing any opinions here, just kind of echoing back what, what I was in that was in the survey results. Um, Low light was also the initiative management, as I mentioned, there was both a highlight and a low light. Uh, some of the of the negatives there were some of the initiatives uh, were hard to follow. People couldn't quite figure out what they were doing and how they could get involved. Um, sometimes lack of technical direction uh, was mentioned, or sometimes maybe they were too ambitious. So lots of good lessons learned, I think, from from initiatives. Um, other things were ineffective delegation, um, you know, too much definition of role, too little definition of role. You know, we saw both of these actually in the, in the results of the of the survey. Um, difficult to get involved. Um, you know, the the signal to noise noise ratio being very high and just kind of generally overwhelming for people. Um, and then contributor burnout. You know, so this idea that the fun got sucked out of you know contributing to core, um, and of, of course that's a, that's a very key issue for us. Um, so these are some of the lowlights, and we can talk about this as a group uh, in a minute. Um, you know, the third question was, what are some of the suggestions? And what you'll notice is that not all of the lowlights have a suggestion, so it's something that we'll have to circle back on. But there was many many great suggestions, and again we kind of summarized them and ranked them by how often. Uh, they were mentioned, um, but the number one suggestion was release fewer things sooner. Um, make changes more granular as well. You know, people want more um, small pieces. Uh, do one thing at a time. Personally, a little skeptical about that one. Um, you know, with 3,000 people contributing, I don't think we can go to doing one thing at a time. Um, but um, I think what they're trying to say is, 
maybe we want fewer disruptive changes happening at the same time. Maybe it's not quite one, but maybe it's not like a hundred at a time. There's some uh, heavy balance there probably. Um, improve core funding is another one. Um, you know, that's a great suggestion. Question with a lot of these is how, right? Um, I do do that, and uh, I mean that's definitely been an active conversation. I'm happy to talk more about that today as well. Improve communication. Um, you know, componentize or decouple Drupal core, and uh, there's. People expressed that in two ways, but primarily it was about the fact that the code was architecturally, that the code was a little bit too tightly coupled. People would love to see um, you know, smaller components or more isolated components that were maybe more reusable. Just like we started to use components from other projects, can we you know, get to a point where, more, where other projects can start to reuse some of our components? Um, and then sometimes people also meant, um, to a lesser extent, they, they meant how the uh, core is managed it itself, meaning maybe it's more of a, you know, do we manage it, manage it in one Git repo or do we actually split up core in you know, smaller chunks? And each of these chunks could be maintained by you know, different groups of people. Right? So there's organizationally and architecturally. Um, improve UX. Quite a few people also pointed that out. Um, and then adopt a process for time-based releases, which I happen to talk about in my keynote. Uh, but we can definitely talk more about that as well. Actually, in general, I think the proposal that I made in the keynote, I think, will help with several of these items on the slide. I think it will force us to work on fewer things at the same time. I think the feature branching, some complexity with the merges, which will make it uh, a little bit more difficult to do 100 things at the same time, and so we'll have to think a little bit more about when are we going to do what. At the same time, as I mentioned in the Q&A, I don't want to kill this, this idea of sort of permissionless innovation where people can just like you know, get involved and do something great without there being a plan. Um, so yeah, and so with that, I think we can go to the discussion. We have a, create a quick Google Doc. So we're going to try and take notes. Um, that way, we, we, you know, we track all of your ideas and suggestions, and uh, we'll make sure to follow up on all of them. So, I'd say a quick summary of the survey results. What do you think? That's good. Does anyone has any first suggestions, ideas? Is it useful to go back to the previous slide, maybe? Just come to the mic, say your name, and make your point. Someone has to be first. Yep. My name is Eric, um, uh, Sutherson. Um, I was missing one thing on your low lines, but it's related to it. Um, I'm concerned about the time it takes for. Um, Decisions to be made in issues. <laughs> Last weeks, I've been following, uh, participating in the placeholder discussions, but in the past as well, issues with hundreds of comments. And I get the idea that some people just want to have their opinion in the issue queue, and and we only want to make decisions by consensus. I've always been um, explaining that by the size of the community and the complexity of decisions, but um, it's a risk, I think, if this gets even longer in the future. And it has, it's related to, to, to burnout as well. If you put a lot of time and effort in, in an issue and it, it gets stalled or, or uh, it halts and there's no decision made, that, that's extremely frustrating. I think it's a great point. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have a quick answer. There's no magical solution, but uh, issues, you know, sometimes it's slow, but it's slow for different reasons, right? Sometimes it's because there's actually no agreement, <laughs> and we, we do need a little bit of time to figure out the answer. Sometimes it's because, um, you know, the right people aren't in the issue, um, so that can be the, the source. So I think. 
I agree. I think we need to break down. I think both, both a good next step could be to try and break down and, and figure out what are all of the different different reasons why sometimes these issues take so long and which ones are valid and which ones you know we can figure out solutions for. Um, so I think it would be a good exercise to, to analyze a little bit more. Yeah, we. we I have no, no answers to, but um, perhaps there are other communities or other discussion for us which do work better with the dark web. Different tools, you mean? Um, yeah, tools. And, and it's, I think it's also about strategy. How do you come to the decision? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you do you wait until every 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 idea is in the issue queue, or do you just take a decision and go and go from there? And maybe. Sometime later, a month or half a year later, you change your mind. Right. Well, that's great feedback. I think it's been uh, an ongoing conversation, to, to be honest, over the years. Like, how can we evolve the way we decisions? How can we make decisions faster without compromising the quality? I mean, it's a very complicated topic, obviously. Larry. Hi, this is Larry Garfield, Krell. Um, I agree with. Everyone who spin stuff with a survey overall. Um, what in particular I want to touch on is uh, on the time management front. A lot of these touch on it tangentially, especially early on in the process when we didn't know how long we would have for development. We don't know how long the dev cycle is going to be. That means everyone is thinking in terms of okay, what's the most I can possibly do? And everyone's thinking big. No one's thinking incremental. And since we don't know when freeze is going to be. Or and we don't know when the real freeze is going to be, and we don't know when the real real freeze is going to be, and you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that means that you know, the question of do we do this in a quick way or the right way, it's it's really hard to answer. And uh, the answer to that was different in every single issue. Of, you know, do we take the time to refactor this first? Do we take the time to you know make sure this is properly tested, or do we just build something because we have deadlines to deal with? Okay, the deadline didn't actually happen. So now we go back and do it the right way. No, we've got this other thing. So just that pressure of not knowing how much we had to do, not knowing how much time we had to do it in, meant that the, the code quality, I think, was very, very uneven in terms of how much effort we put into doing things right, given not knowing how much time we had to do it. Um, and as I said, it was extremely uneven throughout the entire cycle. Uh, I, I'm certainly not going to say I was immune to that myself. Uh, that's, I think, another you know, advantage of the December switch for Drupal 8. Uh, and I hope that when years from now, <laughs> when we start on Drupal 9, um, we'll have a, a tighter known timeline for it as well. Uh, just help us, you know, get, give us a sense of, okay, what is that balance point? How can we make that balance point work? When do we take the time to, you know, do Eight patch long site you know, processes for something when we have to do it in one patch. Just better guidance around that, and better collective sense around you know what we can do in amount of time. I think would be extremely helpful for everyone's uh, stress and sanity levels. Yeah. I agree. Uh, at the same time, I don't think that just you know communicating dates earlier is was really going to change anything. I think um, I think the the feature branching workflow that, that I discussed in the keynote, I think it's it's going to be more effective. Yeah, um, it, it's definitely you know, mul multiple facets, um, but I know some of the conversations I had very early back in 2011 were along the lines of, I don't know how much time we have, so let's just go for this and see what happens. Right. Uh, so that it, it's uncertainty breeds uneven result. I guess is what I'm getting at. So having more certainty around the work process and the work timeline will help give us better code quality because we know when we can take the time to you know, really invest in something and when we can't. That's something we just never really knew in this cycle. Right. I think it's fair. I think we can always do better communicating. Like we opened the A branch and we said, let's just go. <laughs> and then we did announce a feature freeze date, you know, many months ahead of the actual feature freeze. So you know we did we did give people that heads up, but then of course it didn't happen, right? And so the thing is with the feature freeze, like if you if you if you don't say it, 
then people don't actually um, either they don't start doing any any work or um, and then when you do say it of course you miss it so it's like it's really not a very effective way to manage the process to be honest because um, you know really what it's been like it's been like funneling people through this um, you know funnel and, and, and screwing the whatever it's called the screws <laughs> and making them a little tighter along the way down um, and, you know that's what we've, we've been trying to do but it's yeah. It's not a great way. <laughs> it's definitely more than just an out of state. There's more to it than that. Yeah. So I'm Joel. Um, it's obvious to a lot of people in the room that uh, your, your proposal, and I think it's more than a proposal at this time, uh, to make semantic version will address, I would say, the vast majority of the points in this slide. Uh, what about the other points? Stuff like uh, improved core funding, improved communication, improved UX that are that simply are not addressed with it. Uh, what's the plan on going further on with it? Especially Eric uh, clearly addressed the improved communication. We we bike share and we nitpick a lot in the issues. Mm -hmm. um, there should be a way to to copy. Somewhere. Yeah, I think one of the things we briefly discussed this week with a, with a group of people, including um, you know the, the other core committers, um, not not that that means it's it's finalized or anything, but is this idea of having maybe a special issue um, that people need to you know submit that basically explains here's what I'd like to do, roughly how I want to do it, um, that then kind of needs or gets like a thumbs up. Um, ahead of time versus people going down the path and then after spending three months, six months, and nine months, we're like, uh, I don't think that's... Something like a thumbs up. So, so, oh, sorry, said it again? Yeah, something like... like yeah, so just like, or, you know, or, like, or, like, or, like, or, like uh, or the tanks, or the idea that that might be so easy to put into the, into the, the current system we have, and it would probably improve the system a lot. Right. Yeah, we don't. We wouldn't need new tools. It's just a relatively small process change, and it gives people that, like, yep, you know, the core committers looked at this. It and this is something that is core worthy. We generally believe this is the right architecture. You can include even some design in that. You know, like this is what we think it would look like. Uh, these kinds of things. And then the other thing, as it relates to UX, I, I really do think we need to start doing more prototyping early on. And you know, getting um, people to really, you know, sign off on, on these prototypes or these or, or these UX mockups, um, because that's the other thing that often went wrong. Like we would just build something, and then in the end, we would learn that it's not actually very usable. <laughs> so, yeah, you. in our uh, in our uh, session on. Sorry. Hi, I'm Angie Webchick. Um, he did say to Angie, so. Um, but yeah, in our talk we gave on the, the usability testing results, the tail end of that talk, we spitballed a few ideas around this, right? Uh, you know, and what normal uh, people do who are building a product is they try really, they try to make through this loop really fast of building something and then measuring the impact and then learning about that and then building the next thing and trying to do that very, very, very quickly. It's a methodology called lean. It's very buzzword compliant, um, but there's a lot of sense there, and we don't do that at all right now. We basically build and build and build in this like spiral, and then once in a while we have like a University of Minnesota come along and give us a dark room in the basement where we can watch people struggle, and then we learn a lot, but by then we build the thing and we can't really integrate it as well. So we've talked about doing some things like, for example, we have like these uh, weekly Euro criticals calls that happen lately, like that's a chance for people who are working on critical issues to get together and jam. Something like a monthly product manager call where it's like get the UX design and product folks, have a monthly cadence to them because you probably need a little bit longer of a window. Set up an agenda where like this week we're gonna, or this time we're gonna handle field UI and you get the field UI maintainers involved. 
We look at the UX testing videos and figure out what went wrong. We spitball some ideas really quickly in some kind of a prototyping tool and very rapidly get knowledge share between the people who have seen the problems, the people who can fix the problems, and the people who maintain the subsystems and get synergy happening there. Sorry, I have to stab myself in the face for using that word. Um, and then we can do a bunch of other things, like for example, demo the stuff that's in progress, the stuff that's already made it in core, get early feedback off them. Because even when we're releasing every six months, that's still an incredibly slow time to get feedback on what you're doing. So anyway, when I get back from Barcelona, and when Drupal is out, I have more brain space to think about all this. But you know, Boyan, Lewis, you know, we have, they're all aligned that something like this would be really great. We need a way to onboard design and UX people because they are not going to battle it out in the core issue queue, um, but they would maybe participate in something like this. So if you have ideas, please ping me because I'd love to hear how to make this process better. So, I'd love to see these things happen, and, and frankly, um, I don't think it has to be too hard. Like just the, like we got up the islands with our tools and our code, we kind of have to get up the island with our development process. And how we implement things because there are all you know there's like years and years of experience of how you build products, um, you know, development methodologies like Scrum, you know, all these things, and we just need to look at those and figure out how do we, you know, adapt them to open source. I'm not saying it's super easy always, but I do think there's a tremendous amount of stuff to learn from what other organizations do, whether they're open source or not. We're not the first ones to, to figure this out. Hi, I'm Timo, and um, I just wanted to say, like, very nice work. I discovered somehow in football one year ago. Uh, I have to say, I still struggle to co contribute to core, so I'd rather contribute to some modules situated on it. It's a bad word. Uh, then uh, going through the patch system. And, um, so tooling is very important and one simple but near, nearly, uh, near thing is uh, just using, uh, for example, SAS or other pre-processing tools that would help improve UX, for example, or at least uh, the coding on the visual side. So that's the thing designers do today. So uh, I really love the uh, look ahead on PHPS PHP 7 at the moment. So why don't we also have a look ahead for the visual design? I think that's one major struggle at the moment. Right. So you use basically you use more modern tools, and that will help us attract you know more more people to help because that, these are the tools that they want to use. Is that is that a good summary? Yeah. Um, that there are tools that they are used to. Right, exactly. Good advice. Um, anyone else? I guess I can pick up on on, a, on the previous question a little bit around that, you know, core funding was, was brought up as, a, as another item on the list. Um, this is one that I've been pretty passionate about. Uh, I've done several blog posts trying to encourage other organizations to Hire you know full-time core computers, and with some success, I think you know Alex and Kathy are two examples. Which um, you know two two people that have been hired, um, you know, to work full-time on core, possibly inspired by some of these blog posts. But obviously, a lot of other people have been doing work in this in this area too. Um, I think a good next step here would be to figure out how we can measure the impact of having full-time people on staff and sort of, um, you know, trying to quantify that so that it makes sense for other organizations to see like, you know, chapter three hired Alex, this was great for us because these and these reasons, right? It's, it's connecting these dots now, I think, that will inspire more organizations to do the same and obviously the same with Kathy and, and her employer, so Black Mesh. Um, so I guess that, that would be an ask for Alex and Kathy to try and help figure that out. Uh, it's not easy, <laughs> but to the extent that we can, I think it would help a lot. Um, the, on the other side, the Drupal Association did the D8 Accelerator <coughs> campaign, which uh, in many ways was a success. You know, we were able to raise $250,000, which helped accelerate a lot of the critical 
uh, you know, bug fixing. But at the same time, you know, $250,000 isn't a whole lot of money either. And it took a significant effort to raise that money. So it wasn't a slam dunk either, at least in my mind. It, it, it worked. It took a lot of hard work. Um, but if I think about what we would really need here, is it would probably add a zero to that number and multiply it by some number as well. So, um, you know, if you really want to make sure, um, you know, we're building, um, you know, we, we, we get all of the people that we could use full time, that, that would be a, in a completely different ballpark in my mind. Um, doesn't mean we get there overnight, but the um, question there is how do we scale that program? How can we get more people to, to fundraise? And then the third piece of this is that uh, a year ago at Drupal from Barcelona, um, you know, I, I talked about this idea of selective benefits and kind of more subtle ways to provide incentives for organizations to fund core development. Uh, and I still personally believe that that is a good idea. Um, and we have made some progress there. Um, we have basically commit credits now, so for every every commit we check who was a committer and then who actually funded the work, which Drupal shop, which digital agency, which customer, you can specify all of these things. And then we translate these credits in benefits. Like for example, yesterday we launched a new marketplace page on Dido, and now the marketplace page is listed by no longer alphabetically, or some of our best contributors were on page 27, but now they're listed by, um, you know, how many commits or how many patches did they help, um, how many issues did they help fix in, in, a, in a time frame, basically. And so these are the things that hopefully will provide more incentive for organizations to tell their employees that, yeah, sure, you, you know, you can work on, on, uh, on core for a bit. Because here's how we're going to get the benefits and um, that progress. Um, so, so that is all good. We have much more work to do there, I would say. Like we've only started to roll out some of these benefits. So I, I think we're trying to attack the problem from multiple angles. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the other is cultural, maybe. You know, as we build our own companies and as our companies become successful or as they are well funded, um, we, we, you know, we should maybe have an expectation that people contribute. You know, we should, we should uh, figure out ways to, to make that a standard. That you know, that that is the accepted behavior. So, anyway, no, no easy answers on this one, I think. Uh, hi, Drew's on Paul. This is more a question than a suggestion or, or, or a question from that. Um, but obviously we're then developing any kind of sub software, or starting group like, there needs to be some form of planning at the beginning where we decide what more or less is, is going into it. And, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, there were the core contributors and, and the initiative leads and a bunch of other people heavily involved in that. Maybe there were 100 people really actively involved in that process. And then at some point later on the, down the line, um, the, kind of the, the, the bulk of the rest of the people with less experience, like myself, uh, maybe getting involved, so maybe that turned into 1,000 people at some point. Do you think we got the balance right for um, you know, when when we managed to bring those people in, would it have been better if if, if the, the bulk contributors were more involved in the process earlier, or if there was more of a time with less people getting a real plan together um, you know, in place, so you know, so it didn't come kind of descend into chaos really quickly because it was everyone trying to do a hundred different things. It's a great question. Um probably would want to think a little bit about that <laughs> in terms of um, providing an answer. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I think one of the things we did is we, we did a survey um, you know, before we started the AAA development branch, and I'm hoping to do one for AAA too, 
um, several thousands of people um, answered the survey. So that gave us general direction of the kinds of things people wanted to see in Drupal 8. Um, and we could then segment these results by persona, developers would like to see this, you know, non-developers would like to see this, themers would like to see, you know, this. And so we used that data um, to then formulate some initiatives. But then it was really about identifying the right people to run that initiative that then would make more detailed plans. Um, so that's kind of the way we, we approached it. Um, I still feel that was directionally the right way to do it. Um, and then over time, people would rally behind these initiatives, like I think, even if it was not an official initiative, but you know, a lot of people rally behind Twig. You know, people got involved once they knew this is what we wanted to do. People started to help. Um, that was also the case with some of these other initiatives. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure we could have activated, if you will, all of these people without some sort of, you know, without like some concrete direction, like here's all the ways you can help. Um, but could we have benefited from more planning and upfront design and thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess without having thought about the question a lot, I think, um, you know, um, I think we did a lot of things right, but then there's a lot of room for improvement still on top of that. So. Thanks. Hello, um, this question. Uh, Angie was talking about UX text testing. Um, this is the Minnesota University that does that. Does the Drupal Association be, uh, is paying the university to, to, to do that? Okay, maybe you. Uh, for me, as a developer, um, Co-funding is about flying people around and taking down bugs, but maybe you should like put some money into UX text testing and be, make that make that more frequent. Yeah, I think it would be great to get more time and effort and money uh, towards UX testing. I mean, the truth is that the Drupal Association is also not like a bag of money. <laughs> You know, like there isn't that much money in the Drupal Association that could be funneled into core development, which is was one of the reasons why we had to raise two hundred fifty thousand dollars to help unblock critical. So, um, you know, I think, you know, so I think while the idea is good, I don't know how practical it is for the Drupal Association to start funding these kinds of things. This is Angie. Just want to respond real quick. Um, I think that's a good idea. I think there's universities who'd be willing to do this for us for free. We should get how far we can down the path of that first. What I would love to see, though, is us transition away from the big bang. We have to wait for a university to give us lab space for free, and more to how can we make a user testing process that's so lightweight that anyone in this room can do it, and we can trust the results. And so there's tools that people use, like user testing that works, like crowdsource usability testing, or we could write up a guide on how to do it yourself. So I think the only way we're going to get the velocity we need is if everyone in this room does this and does it as part of how they work. So that would be my thought. I think that's well said. Like I think, you know, I think very few organizations have access to these fancy usability labs with, you know, the, the, the mirrored windows and all the tools, like most usability testing, is somebody walking around the hallway of an organization with some paper testing, you know. And, I'm not saying that's the solution either, but um, I think it's. I think most of it is, is really cultural, you know, just making part of the way the way you work. Just to wrap up, yeah, uh, I think uh, usability testing is just a black box for me. Oh, well, in the Drupal world, so not for that uh, for that question, but um, quickly, um, you, the main problems for me uh, during your session was about uh, feature bench um, development. And I think this is tackling more than a point, as you said. Uh, but uh, it's really um, when you when you think about the future, uh, the coupled core would be really nice to have um, this kind of feature separately, and maybe teams working on that. And the, the initiative thing was kind of a start that we should really maybe um, uh, make a survey, a deeper survey about that. That's it. Thank you. Great, great point. Thank you. So in regards to improved core funding, uh, I have to say I just 
thing before this session from a, a nice panel uh, on to on, on paid contributions uh, that addresses a lot of it. And uh, your comment on the, the new marketplace page, I think it, it's very relevant. <coughs> I think it's one of the only ways that we can, uh, that because this is going to be a marketing tool, it's going to be one of the ways that we can get companies to have paid contributors. But uh, this gave rise to a new job, and uh, we're very bright, and, uh, and uh, some of us have worked in, uh, in cheating a major corporation on how to improve our rankings in their uh, front page. Uh, everyone that knows a bit about SEO kind of knows that. And uh, this new change just gave rise to a new job called uh, Drupal Marketplace Optimization Expert. <laughs> <laughs> and um, as an aside, one of my mentors, Khalid Malayding, he had uh, a company that was amazing for him. This company was called Two Bits. And for years, he was the first company that everybody saw on that page. Uh, I'm not saying he did it on purpose, but it was nice that he did it. So how do we fight? Because I, I've seen how it works. I've seen what it sorts on. And I, I can pick up one of my modules that no one uses, start committing to it like crazy. And my company is going to rise to the first position. It's going to outrun yours in five minutes. Um, how do we stop that? It's <laughs> not saying that you, your company should be the first one. Uh, well, you know, I think, first of all, I don't think Kelly did that on purpose either. You know? <laughs> I think his, his company was, was generally called two bits many, many years before we even had a market uh, marketplace page. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great example of how, uh, you know, as I said, some of the best computers that are name and logo would be on page 27, and then those that maybe don't con contribute at all, or very little, would, would get the most visibility, which is kind of wrong. But sure, any of these systems, credit systems, they're, you know, they open the door for abuse, right, and for people gaming the system. And so it's something that we'll have to deal with. Um, you know, I, I hope that we can also all keep each other honest, you know, that we have this, this um, you know, honor system, and if somebody violates the rules by which we, we like to live, then they should be called out for it and hopefully um, be with them, you know, undo, you know, undo the, the abuse. And so, yes. I can make a very, very, uh Simple suggestion that yeah. I think would defeat my commitment to the like the salsa module right. that is used by like three people. Um, it's got been a nice name though. Um, it's mine. Uh, so one thing that could be done is we do know how many people are using each module, and uh, Drupal four, of course, has, is the most used one. You can't use Drupal you know, yet. Um, and uh, so if you if you do some kind of weighting on the contributions on, on that list of how many uh, contributions have been done by a company by the usage of the module or the, the project that they are contributing to that might defeat well it would truly give rise to, to the job of the Drupal marketplace optimization yeah. because you need to, to be really smart about doing it. <laughs> That's a good idea, and uh, along the lines of some, you know, in my keynote last year, I talked about how we can use this system and, and sort of dial the knobs all the time based on what, what we need the most of. Like, for example, right now, it would have been great if we could have said, you know, fixing a release blocking blood, bug is going to get you 10 credits, and maybe, you know, fixing a documentation bug in a module that only two people use is maybe going to get you fewer credits. But then when we you know, once we have released Drupal 8, we could dial up, you know, people porting modules, especially key modules. Like, there's different ways we can, you know, kind of direct the fire hose, if you will, of, of where people, you know, hopefully where people will, will make their contribution. So, um, so I think it, it's a fair concern, um, people gearing the system. I'm less worried about it, to be honest. I feel like if, if somebody would race to the number one spot and everybody would be like, who are they? They would start looking into what they do. If it's clear that they're abusing the system, I think there would be some sort of, uh, you know, correction. So. Hey, uh, Michael or Schnitzel, um, I want to turn a bit on the burnout stuff. Um, so Larry and me uh, gave a presentation. We also made a survey, 
Um, and we had 75 people responding, and 75% of these people said that they actually feel burnout or really stressed. And for me, that number was way too high, especially for the future for all of us. Um, and um, what we also did, we asked people like if they uh, know what to do against it, and a lot of people just answered no. Like, so a lot of people in the community feel burned out or feel helpless. So I think it's a, um, yeah, it's something we should definitely talk about. And I know that um, the community working group of the of the association board currently has it not on the list. It's more about fighting conflicts or com first, um, working with conflicts. But I think that's still the right place. Um, but overall, I feel like if anybody that did that survey and feels like that, I think uh, Mike Bell said it really right in the in the keynote this morning um, to seek help. And health doesn't mean that you have to run to your doctor. It doesn't mean to we can also just talk about it. Um, and if you're more interested, um, NG, NG's Twitter account is full of basically um, um, a write down of what we talked about, or you can listen to the video. But I think it's uh, something that really astonished me that there's so many people there um, that have that are in that situation. I think it's a very important topic. I'm, I'm not an expert on burnout. Um, to be honest, uh, but I think it's great that we talk about it. I think we, I, it, I think it's great that at DrupalCons we have sessions about it that helps people, um, you know, learn about it and figure out ways to prevent it. Um, I think some of it is um, self-inflicted as well. Um, I think you know people have to learn how to step out of a situation that's not healthy, and it's sometimes very difficult when you feel a lot of pressure, right? Um, but some of some of it is something. That, that you know, people themselves have, have to learn. Um, you know, I've been sharing this publicly, but I had a burnout once, um, probably nine years ago. It's the only time and the last time that I had a burnout. Um, and you know, I didn't handle it well, and so I kind of stumbled in it. Then all of a sudden, you know, I had a burnout, and I really had to step away. I think I stepped away from core development for about a month. Um, and it, it learned me a lot of things. So sometimes, at least for me, sadly, it's like I have to cross that line to learn. Uh, if we can prevent that from happening, I think um, that would be great. People, you know, there's things we can do. You know, like very simple rule should probably be that people in key positions they should they shouldn't be the only person being able to do that job. Like if we can surround them with people that can help them if they're a team versus an individual. I think it will really give people a little bit of space to say, I need to step out of this for, for a few weeks to, um, you know, to get, to get healthy um, or to get in a better place. So, um, and that's also, frankly, another piece of this is why we have to keep evolving our process all the time to learn. Because I think, um, and maybe I'm speaking for myself more than, you know, like generalizing, but at least for me, I don't mind doing hard work, uh, you know, working long days, as long as it doesn't feel endless. You know, as long as I see, I have to do this for some time, and then after that while, you know, there's, it's gonna be better, it's gonna be different. But it's, if, if it's, if it, if you don't have that, you know, it's gonna be different, it's gonna be better, I think then, I think it really increases the risk of burnout. So we need to evolve our processes to avoid that from happening. Anyway, I'm not the expert on this, but... Go ahead. Hi, thanks, Mike Potter. Um, I, I see a common theme in a lot of these things, um, whether, you know, I think your, your release, uh, feature releases address it a little bit, but like when Angie was talking about the UX stuff, and we don't need to wait until we get some big, huge lab to do it. Um, you know, we talk about these issues that go on for you know, 300 posts because we can't resolve something. I think a lot of us, and myself included, tend to be a little bit uh, perfectionist, mm -hmm. and, and we kind of wait until we can get the, the perfect solution. And that in all of these things, we just need to adopt a more iterative approach, uh, you know, agile, whatever, but just iterative. But it's, it, Amitai gave a, a talk on visual regression uh, a few hours ago, and, and he talked about, you know, hey, 40% is better than 0%. You don't need to wait to do testing until you can solve it all and do 100%. And I think in all these things that we can just kind of be a little bit better about saying, yeah, you know what, in this issue, 
you know, this makes it better, let's do that and you know, create another issue to make it better and just keep making things better in all of these initiatives and not get blocked on, on way making it better. Yeah. I, I think that's very true. Um, that's, what did they say? Perfect is the enemy of, of the good, right? So I think it, it's a very valid point. Thank you, Mike. Hey, I'm Christian Kessner. I'm the old jerk in the get up. Um, I think the sort of the thing about how we bit off a lot and it took a long time to chew is is something a lot of people have mentioned and what I've been thinking about a lot lately is that that's that's not just the mountain we had climbed, but it's the mountain that we all still have to climb in the future as we now look at porting all of these concrete modules, and that's that's sort of relevant to me and a lot of the people I'm talking to where I feel like I know quite a bit about D7, but Troop Lake just seems like this big mountain that I don't know anything about yet. So that seems like this, just something I wanted to mention, is continuing to have relevance, and that relevance is about to get a lot bigger as soon as mm -hmm. October 7th rolls around. So is there, mm -hmm. is that, is there, so I know, and I know there's a lot of stuff, I'm going to tackle that, but it seems like it's about to be a lot bigger problem, and are we yeah. focused on that yet, or are we going to, just hoping we don't all just take a break as soon as the RC comes out. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, there's a lot of things being done. Before I go there, like, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the, the past release cycles, and it's actually important for people to you know, remember, I think, you know, as we get closer to the release and as we do the release, people are really excited, right? It's like, there's all this energy. But then what happens is that that, it, that, that kind of follows um, like the Gartner hype cycle, if you will, you know, have you guys seen this? And so this excitement then like goes down and that's usually where we have the darkest moment of Drupal. It's like when people have to start porting their modules and when people have to relearn everything that they know, which kind of will happen like, you know, once actually Drupal 8 is released. <laughs> And then it may take you know months for us to get you know back out of that um, you know, that dip, uh, and it's it's during these times usually after the release that people start um, getting all worked up, and you know, we'll see blog posts about you know forking and you know all the things we did wrong. And, you know, we will get dire for a while, so just want you to keep that in mind. That actually, if you look at the curve, you know, this is a pretty happy time. Um, <laughs> I really think it is. Maybe not for the core contributors, but you know, just from a, in general as a community, you know, I think um, obviously the, the core contributors are doing a lot and they're working hard and they're tired. Uh, but that will like, you know, other people will, you know, start to feel that way, <laughs> um, and that's something that we shouldn't forget. So, uh, but we are doing things, you know, books are being written. Actually, I asked in a tweet, you know, who's writing a Drupal 8 book? I think there's almost, uh, I think it was a little over 10 books right now that are being written. So documentation is coming, people are contributing documentation too. Um, you know, most of the companies that provide training already have some Drupal 8 training or are in the middle of, you know, providing more training. So we're trying to do a lot of things to, to enable. I think most of the sessions here are also about Drupal 8, um, you know, which will also help. But it is a big mission because, you know, imagine, let's say there's 200,000 Drupal developers in the world. You know, I don't know if that's the right number, but it could easily be, you know, 100,000 or something. Like now we have to retrain 100,000 people uh, on, on, you know, Drupal 8. So um, that's a lot of work, and will will be painful. All right, we have a couple more minutes, so let's do these. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Two uh, more questions, maybe. John Snow. Uh, that's my real name. Winter is coming. Yeah, my comment comment is about the feature branch development. Uh, other projects have found that long running feature branches tend to be hard to manage, hard to merge in harder to review, and that keeping feature branches small seems to be the sweet spot between trunk-based development and um, feature branch development. Right. And one way they've found to, to help with that is with feature toggles or feature flags that allow partially complete features to be merged in, but 
remain disabled? Is there, is there any yeah. chance we could move towards something like that? Yeah, we're talking a lot about this actually, and you know, we've already kind of, you know, we've already said that we should, when we do feature branches, we should really focus on what is the minimum viable version of this feature, or how can you chunk up a feature into smaller steps, where each step is a shippable, you know, is a shippable, um, results in a shippable Drupal 8. It doesn't mean the feature is complete, but I don't know, maybe if you, if you think about layout management, to keep, to keep it simple, you know, there's multiple steps involved there. There's maybe a layout manager, and then there's a layout UI, and you know, two chunks there, but maybe there's even smaller chunks. So we could ship Drupal, um, a future version of Drupal, just with the, with the management layer, and without the, yeah, and the UI layer, um, you know, add that in a future version. So how can we make, you know, chunk large features into, you know, shippable uh, subtasks is one. Um, the other thing we've, we've talked about is uh, actually having uh, sandboxes, which is where you know, teams or individuals who develop features. Then, um, you know, the contributors would then still give patches to the core committers. Core committers would review, you know, bite-sized patches and commit them to the feature branch, so where the core committers are the, actually committing to the feature branch. So that way they review a feature every step along the way and have provided feedback every step along the way. So when it comes to a merge, technically uh, you don't have to do the whole review process again. You've already kind of reviewed every step along the way. So just two things that we've, been, we've, we've talked about. Um, without a doubt, we'll have a lot more things to learn as we go. Hi, oh, yeah, um, Alex Pop here. Um, just wanted to kind of reiterate the point that was just being made about feature branches, and I'm not sure that they're the correct analysis of what went wrong or what made this cycle so long. I think the truth is, is that we're really bad at knowing how much work we have to do when we want to change. Yeah. <laughs> and we assume that, that when we make that minimal change, that we've got a green test run, and then that, that's it, it's done. But so often this cycle, what has seemed a small scope to change, has turned out to be something that has then required a, twice or three times as much follow-up. So I'm, I'm really saying like that the, the decision to open a feature front, the decision to start a major change, is where we have to invest more resources. Yeah, I think that's a valid point as well. Um, I think the advantage of a feature branch is, as I explained in, in the keynote, like if something does take twice as long or three times as long, it doesn't actually hold up other features, right? So it can continue to make releases. So that will give more predictability, more frequent releases. Um, but yeah, we, we need to, you know, we need, to your point, we need to think more upfront about how something will work. Uh, at the same time, we have to accept that we can't always figure these things out. Like, and it's really hard to, um, to predict almost what the impact will be on every aspect of Drupal, what the total impact of the feature will be on performance. Like some of these things you kind of only know at the end, right? So I think, the, I think that, you know, I think we're limited a little bit in what we can do up front as well. So. I was just going to respond to a point from a couple of minutes ago. This is Angie again. Apparently I love this microphone. Um, about contrib, and now people are kind of like, that definitely is the next wave of things we gotta worry about. So I just wanted to bring awareness to a few things that are happening around that. So the first one is Drupal module upgrader module actually works again. Thank you, Peter Frenessen, Frenessen, yay. And that module is awesome because it will scan your module, it will tell you here are the specific change records that affect you, so you don't have to look through that enormous list. And if you want, it will automatically convert some basic stuff like info to YAML and plugins to blocks and this kind of stuff. So definitely start with that if you're panicking because it's a good tool to learn some about Drupal 8 if you've kind of been not involved in it recently. The second big thing I wanted to point out is that the coding lounge last night until three in the morning, we were working on a new contrib project called contrib underscore tracker. This is going to be a central issue queue to track 
projects in issues and what their reporting status is so that people no longer have to have a spreadsheet for every single project that they're working on about where's this module at in Drupal-A, where do I find the code, this kind of thing. So one place for the community to bring up all of that information and we're hoping that this will help um, not only with Drupal-A adoption but also just like tease little details out of people's heads um, and give one place for all that information to filter up that's community-wide. Uh, so that is hopefully launching tonight. I'm going to try and put a blog post together. And then if you're interested in working on something cool with the sprints tomorrow, uh, filling that tracker out with all the major modules would be awesome. So um, that's it. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for, um, thanks for, thanks for showing up and caring. You know, thanks for willing to, to make Drupal better. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't have all the answers. This is just the start of a conversation, I think. And uh, you know, let, let's all work together and figuring out what exactly we want to change and how we want to change it. So, thank you. I think next is the closing session. If you guys are interested in that, um, we're going to make some announcements about where the next Drupal cons will be, and so it'll be fun. All right. Thank you. Thank you.